We are officially coming into soup season, and if you are tired of the same old soups and just need some new inspiration, I have got you covered. This first recipe is something that I make pretty much every fall, as soon as squash starts coming into the grocery stores. And best of all, it is totally meal prep friendly, so you are gonna wanna make a huge batch of this and just store your leftovers in the freezer. I love having soup in the freezer because it freezes really well, it reheats really well, and soup is just such a great filling meal, especially in the winter time. It is so nice and warm and cozy. So we're going to make a carrot ginger butternut squash soup and add a little bit of red lentils in there for some extra protein. So we're just gonna start out by washing and chopping all of the veggies for this soup first. And we want just enough broth to cover all of the vegetables here. So for me, that was about eight cups. And also it is okay to have a little bit extra broth here because we are gonna add in those red lentils later. So those will soak up some of the broth as well. And I'm just using my Better Than Bouillon broth paste and already minced ginger that I keep in the freezer. And so this is just one and a half cups of rinsed red lentils. Totally optional, but I do like to use some kind of either cashew cream or coconut cream in this recipe. I feel like it just adds a really nice creaminess and richness to the soup. So I just happen to have some coconut cream left over in the fridge. Or like I said, you could also use cashew cream, which is just blended cashews in water, or you could just leave it as is. Now you can use the immersion blender here. If you like it really, really smooth and creamy, I suggest using a regular blender, but of course you're gonna have to wait until the soup is fully cooled to do that. Now very important here to leave some space if you are going to be putting these in the freezer. So I like to leave at least an inch of space at the top and that is because liquids are going to expand in the freezer and it doesn't matter if you're using plastic or glass, the container will crack and you will have a big mess in your freezer. It's just not worth it. So always leave a little bit of extra space at the top of whatever you're going to be freezing. Now, if you're looking for some tips on how to batch prep and store soup so that you can make bigger batches and really save yourself time, I've actually made a free PDF guide all about soup storage. So I will link that down below. Of course, if you're on my mailing list, you have this in your inbox already, but if you're not yet and you do want your own copy, make sure you check out the link and I will send you one for free. Now, I also love soup season because it can be really budget friendly and the next soup I'm gonna share with you is definitely in line with that. My husband Q and I have a food budget that we try and stick to every month. And one really good way I found to do that is to use up food that you already have sitting in the pantry or the freezer. So today I'm going to be making a mixed grain congee using our pantry staples. And actually, if you already have cooked rice in your fridge, I am going to show you the most simple congee recipe where you can use up already cooked grains. So for those of you who like to batch cook your grains and you're looking for some new ways to use them up, you can turn them into congee very easily using this method. So make sure you stay till the end of the video if you want that version. And with that, let's get started. At its most basic, congee is literally just white rice and water. It's a kind of thick porridge that is made by cooking the rice long enough to break it down into a porridge consistency. It's often eaten as a comfort food when you're sick and also commonly for breakfast, or as my husband likes to say, it's really an anytime food. Since we're making a mixed grain congee, we're going to use a couple other grains in addition to our white rice. Today, I'm going to be using buckwheat, millet, white rice, and mung beans. I also like to add in some flavor enhancers. I personally always use ginger because I really like the flavor. And I also always use veggie broth instead of plain water. You can even add other flavor enhancers such as dried mushrooms if you wish. But as I mentioned, congee is pretty plain flavor wise, so feel free to keep it simple. And we're going to be using the Instant Pot today to cook our congee, but you can also make this on the stove top. It will take a little bit longer to cook, but it's a very hands-off type of cooking. So if you want, you can just start it an hour before dinner time and just let it simmer on the stove until you're ready to eat it.
So I also like to add veggies into my congee, but I always like to cook it plain first and add the veggies after. And that is because I don't really like my veggies overcooked. And also if you are going to be freezing it, I just find that it freezes a little bit better when it's plain. And then you can just add it in your veggies when you take it out to thaw it or reheat it. So now that this is cooked, I'm just gonna add in some frozen corn. And if I had that frozen rice cauliflower from Costco, I would add that in at this point as well. And then you can also add other veggies such as cooked bok choy or cooked broccoli, or you can even add things such as like cooked squash or cooked sweet potato. But for those things, I like to cook them separately and then just add them in as kind of like the same way I would with the toppings. Every time I serve out a portion, I just add those cooked veggies with it and then reheat and eat. Now, while congee is a pretty plain soup, it makes up for it with the toppings. Toppings are everything. So I'm just gonna go over some of the ones we like to use. Now, some of these do have oil, so if you are oil-free, you can just leave those out. I pretty much always include a fresh element such as green onions or cilantro. I also like to add pepper, either white pepper or black pepper, toasted sesame seeds or sesame oil, chili oil, Chinese pickles, preserved mushrooms, mushroom floss, or fermented tofu. If you've never tried fermented tofu before, it's quite an intense flavor and a little bit goes a long way. It's a little bit stinky when you smell it, but the taste is so good. It is like salty and creamy and adds a really nice flavor to kanji. So if you do come across it, give it a try. And then I know probably like the least traditional topping we could find, but I find that this is actually a perfect complement to kanji because it has salt, it has sesame seeds, and it has those crispy little onion pieces. So if you have something like this, this actually makes a really good topping for kanji. And you really only need a couple of toppings to make great kanji, so don't feel like you need to use all of these. Even if you only had cilantro, green onion, and pepper, that would still be delicious. Now, if you only have cooked rice or other cooked grains, I'm gonna show you the super simple method to turn it into kanji. This next recipe is truly a classic soup that is also quite budget friendly, and it is just one of my all time favorite soups. I am guaranteed to make this at least a few times every year throughout fall and winter. It's cozy and comforting and perfect for chilly days when you just want something hearty and satisfying to curl up with. So for this recipe, we will need lentils, veggie broth, and veggies of your choice. Now, if you don't have the exact same ones that I do, that is okay. Feel free to substitute with whichever ones you have on hand. Of course, I will leave the full recipe in the description box below, as well as some options and modifications. And let's get started by washing these veggies. And we'll also just quickly rinse the lentils and get our veggie broth ready. Now, very important to note here, I am doubling this recipe to make an extra large quantity so that I can store some in the freezer. Even though I do love cooking, some days I would rather just let something defrost from the freezer and have a healthy meal ready to go rather than making something from scratch. So this is just gonna help set us up for those days when we're feeling a little bit lazy. So now that our pot is hot, let's go ahead and add in the onion first, followed by the garlic, and now the carrots, celery, and potato. Now we'll just add our veggie broth, 
and lastly the lentils. Optionally at this point you could add in any other seasonings you like like a bay leaf or thyme or some garlic or onion powder. I'm just gonna add in a bay leaf to ours and then we'll just let it simmer. So once the soup comes up to a boil we are gonna reduce the heat and just let it simmer for about 25 to 30 minutes and at this point it is a very hands-off recipe we're just gonna leave it alone to simmer so you can work on anything else in the kitchen that needs to be done. If you have some dishes to do or you want to prep another recipe you can go ahead and do that now. Now once it's been about 25 or 30 minutes, you can check to see if your soup is done. Basically, we're just looking to see if all the veggies are softened and also to make sure that the lentils are fully cooked. If it is ready to go, you can go ahead and serve it up and eat it. Or you can add in some greens like baby spinach or kale. I'm just using this kale that we've already prepped. Now with our soup, as I mentioned, I made a large batch so that we can portion some out and pop it into the freezer. So I am just gonna let it fully cool on the stove top. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and portion out a bowl of this and taste it. I love that this meal is not only delicious and warm and comforting, but it's also protein and fiber packed, so it keeps me full for a long time, and it is just so, so tasty. Now the next soup is a Vietnamese soup that my husband Q grew up eating a lot. And even though it looks intimidating, it's actually quite simple to make. There are only a few spices needed and it is so flavorful and delicious, it is really worth making. So even though this soup is written P-H-O, it is actually pronounced pho. Pho. Okay. It is a Vietnamese soup usually made with a flavorful broth, rice noodles, and typically some kind of meat, either chicken or beef. And this is hands down one of Q's favorite dishes and it is actually so easy to make. I don't know why we don't make this more often because it is really so easy. So for those of you who don't know, my husband Q is Chinese, but his family is actually from Vietnam. So his mom makes amazing Vietnamese food and Q loves pretty much all Vietnamese food. So pho is really all about the spices and depending on who you ask, everyone will have a different answer on what the best spices are to make pho. Even in Vietnam itself, you will find very different tasting pho. When Q and I went to North Vietnam, he was like, why does this pho taste so different? Because he's used to the Southern style and apparently the North and the South styles can be made very differently. When I very first started making pho, I wanted to make some for Q. And first I looked up an authentic Vietnamese recipe and then compared it to what Q's mom uses. And the two recipes were very, very different. So according to to my mother-in-law, you only really need these three spices. Cinnamon, star anise, and cardamom. But of course in their pho, they also use a lot of meat, which of course also adds flavor. So I just feel in the vegan version, I like to use a little bit extra spices for a little more of a rounded out flavor. But if you only have access to some of the spices, do make sure you get at least these three. With all that said, I would not say that I am an expert at making pho, and this is not to be regarded as an authentic recipe, but instead as a healthy whole food plant-based version. So here are the spices that I'm going to be using today. But like I said, even if you only have these three ingredients, you can still make yummy pho. So the next thing we are going to need is onion and ginger. We are going to make a large broth today, so I'm going to use two onions and about a six inch piece of ginger. And we are going to char both the onion, ginger, and all the spices, but I like to do them separately because I find that the spices toast a lot faster than the onion and ginger. So the spices, we only want them lightly toasted, so I'm going to do those in the pan first. And then the onion and ginger can either be done in the pan as well after the spices are finished, or you can use an oven or toaster oven or open flame or something like that. So let's gather all of our spices and we will toast them for a couple minutes.
Now that the onion and ginger are charred and our spices are toasted, let's go ahead and get our soup broth or stock into a pot. And I'm using 10 cups of stock today. Make sure that is oil-free, sugar-free, and also low sodium if that is something important to you. Or of course, you can also use homemade. Woon Hang actually has a really delicious looking homemade veggie stock that she specifically uses for pho. So I will link her recipe in the description box down below. If you're the kind of person who wants to do an authentic homemade broth, then definitely try Try hers out but if you're like me and you want to be kind of lazy then just use any veggie stock that you have so with our 10 cups of broth in the pot we are going to add in our onions and ginger and also our spices now it works really well to put all of the spices into a container you can use something like this this is a spice ball and you just put everything inside close it up and it hangs on the side of the pot or of course you can also use a spice bag those work as well and i will link some amazon links for these in the description box down below and basically this just makes it a lot easier to remove all the spices at the end but if you don't have either of those that is also fine because you can easily just strain your broth instead so let's go ahead and add our spice ball to the pot And now we're going to let this broth simmer. Now, I believe a traditional pho should simmer for a long time. You want all of the spices to infuse with the meat. And I just know that my mother-in-law would cook it for like a very long time on the stove, but she always said that the veggie one cooks a lot faster, of course, because you don't really have to cook any meat or anything like that. You're just infusing the broth with the spices. So this can be finished in as little as 30 minutes, but I like to let it simmer for around 60 just to get a little extra flavor in there. And now while that's simmering, we can prepare the rest of our veggies and our toppings. So when your broth is close to being finished, you're going to want to taste it and see if you need to add anything. Now, if I was making a non whole food plant based version, I would typically add something like rock sugar, just a small amount, a very small little piece for a little bit of sweetness and or some vegan fish sauce. Now, I've also read that you can use a light soy sauce in exchange for the fish sauce. Or if you want a very basic and healthy version, you can omit both of these, which we are going to do today. So let's go ahead now and strain the broth, which we are going to do by using a slotted spoon or you can also use a strainer and pour your broth directly into a new container. And now what I like to do is to keep the large amount of broth separate and just prepare a smaller batch for every time I want to make a soup. So now with your prepared veggies, you can either cook them in that smaller portion of broth or you can cook them entirely separately and just add them in all together at the end. And now the last component we are going to need is our noodles. These are just a plain rice noodle that we're using today because it's what we already have in the cupboard, but there are also brown rice noodles. I will link to some of those in the description box down below. You can check those out if you want a healthier option. But for today, we are going to use the white rice noodles. Now for these rice noodles, I think I actually mentioned this in another video. Q has always taught me to soak the noodles in cold water before using them. So usually I will just take this whole package and soak the entire thing in a bowl of cold water for a few hours. Then when we are ready to cook them, we just drain out the soaking water and cook however much we need for our meal. And the others can easily be stored, drained in a Tupperware in the fridge. Now it's also important when you're cooking your rice noodles to cook them al dente because they keep cooking in your bowl and in the broth that you add on top, even after you've served it. So when I cook them, I make them a little bit undercooked and that way when you add on the hot broth and they continue cooking for a few more minutes, they become the perfect texture once you start eating them. So here are some noodles that have been soaked already and we are just going to add them into the boiling water. And you wanna try and separate them with your fingers so that they don't clump up when they're cooking. And we cook them for about three minutes, but basically the best way to test if they're done is to taste them and leave them just slightly undercooked. So once they are just slightly undercooked and have just a slight firmness to them, drain them, add them to your bowls. Ladle in your broth. And then of course your toppings. Some toppings that we like to use are bean sprouts, Vietnamese or Thai basil, very thinly sliced white onion. You could also do some green onion, some coriander. And then of course you can also serve it with a lime wedge that just gets squeezed over the whole bowl right before you eat it. 
Now Q and I will also typically serve ours with a squirt of sriracha and hoisin sauce on a small serving plate side dish next to the bowl that you can dip any of your veggies or your noodles in as you're eating. And voila, you have a beautiful bowl of pho ready to eat. Like I said, the flavors in this are just amazing. If you've never tried pho before, I highly recommend it. The next recipe is another favorite in this house. It is packed full of veggies, fiber, and protein, and I usually make it in the Instant Pot so it comes together really quickly. The original recipe is from Brand New Vegan, and of course I will link it as well as all of the soup recipes from today in the description box in case you want to check them out. But of course I've modified this recipe just a bit to suit our tastes and what we had on hand, and I encourage you to do the same. For today's recipe we are going to need three cloves of garlic, an onion, two bell peppers, and some mushrooms which are optional, but I do really like to use them. Now we are making today's chili in the Instant Pot, but don't worry, you can also make this recipe on the stovetop. Now you have an option here. You can of course saute the onion, garlic, and bell peppers first. Just press the saute button on your Instant Pot and add a little bit of vegetable broth. But I have found it doesn't make that much of a taste difference, so I usually skip that step. And now for our seasonings. We are using a half teaspoon garlic powder, half teaspoon black pepper, one teaspoon paprika. You can also use some smoked paprika here if you'd like. Two teaspoons cumin. And three heaping tablespoons of chili powder. We are also going to use two cups of vegetable broth. I realized my vegetable broth was almost finished here, so I just went ahead and finished the carton, which was actually more like two and a half cups, but anywhere between two and two and a half cups should be fine. And for our three beans today, we are using white kidney beans, red kidney beans, and black beans. I'm using canned because it's all I have. You could, of course, also use homemade beans. And since these are canned beans, I'm just giving them a quick rinse before adding them into our pot. And now we want to give everything a good thorough stir. Make sure everything's pretty well incorporated. And then we're going to add our tomatoes. I'm using this very large can of diced tomatoes and about half of this tomato paste. So this is just leftover tomato paste that I had, which like I said, is about half of that tomato paste can. And now very importantly, if you're using the Instant Pot, you do not want to stir your mixture once you've added the tomatoes. Apparently tomatoes on the bottom of an Instant Pot can ignite the burn warning, so we wanna just leave our tomatoes on the top. But don't worry, as you can see, there's enough liquid here to make sure everything gets cooked. Of course, this is just for using the Instant Pot. If you're cooking this chili on the stove top, you don't have to worry about this. And we are going to set the Instant Pot on the bean slash chili setting for five minutes. And I like to take it off of keep warm, but that is of course up to you. And of course, make sure your nozzle is pointed to sealing instead of venting and let your Instant Pot cook. So after the Instant Pot is finished cooking, I usually let it come down from pressure naturally for about 10 minutes, and then I will release any remaining pressure, which is usually only a small bit. And I just do that by turning the nozzle and waiting for the pin to drop. Once the pin is down, we can open the lid and check on our beautiful chili. So I'm just giving everything a quick stir now. And what I like to do is give it a quick taste and add anything else that I feel it is lacking. I felt this batch needed a bit of sweetness to balance the tomatoes, so I'm adding about a tablespoon of blackstrap molasses and about a cup of frozen corn. As always, I suggest you season to your tastes.
And for garnish, I'm just adding a bit of fresh coriander. And here we have our beautiful final three bean chili. It is very hearty as is, but of course you could also serve it with some brown rice, some sorghum, some camu, maybe with a side of healthy cornbread, basically anything you like to eat your chili with. The next soup is another Asian inspired soup that again is so flavorful and aromatic, but is also really, really healthy. And again, even though it looks intimidating, this soup is actually super easy to make. Anybody can make it very easily at home, but there are a couple special ingredients which may need to be sourced at like a specialty store or perhaps your local Asian market. We are going to need some kaffir lime leaves some galangal, which I have the sliced form here, some whole lemongrass stalks, and some Thai chilies. We will also need some garlic, but I think you guys are familiar with that already. Now, most of these items I actually keep in the freezer and just pull them out as needed for soup. And that is basically just to help them last longer since I don't use these ingredients that often. So first thing we're going to do is to make our broth, which I am just using some water and my better than bouillon broth paste to make a basic veggie broth, but any veggie stock will do here. And now we're going to prepare the flavoring components of this recipe. I am just counting out 10 kaffir lime leaves, five stalks of lemongrass, 10 Thai chilies, and two one inch pieces of galangal. So first thing I'm going to do is just to remove the stems and some of the seeds from our Thai chilies. If you want it very spicy, feel free to leave the seeds in, but just a word of warning, the more seeds that are in the broth, the spicier it will be. Now keep in mind, you can actually keep the tops of the chilies to make yogurt. Now I have not tried this myself, but I have actually seen videos where people just stick the stems into whatever they want to ferment and then you end up with yogurt. So I will leave that video in the description box down below if any of you are keen to try it out. Now I've just rinsed the kaffir lime leaves and I'm just gently tearing or breaking them down a bit to release their aroma a bit more. As you can see, we don't don't want them chopped, just a little bit torn to release their flavor. Now, since this is frozen lemongrass, I don't need to remove any of the outer stalks. If you do buy the fresh lemongrass, you would want to remove at least one layer of husk from the outside. But what I am going to do is just chop them into smaller pieces, and then we are going to whack them to release more flavor. So just take any heavy object you have in your kitchen and just give them a little whack, whack, whack. And then for the garlic, we are just going to smash it as well. So now we want to add all of our aromatics into our soup broth. And we're gonna let that simmer for about 10 minutes. Meanwhile, I'm just going to prepare the mushrooms. I have both small cremony mushrooms, as well as the black oyster mushrooms. But you can use any mushrooms you like. Just give them a quick rinse if they are dirty and then chop them into bite-sized pieces. I like to do a rough chop with the black oyster mushrooms. Just get them roughly into bite-sized pieces. And then with the cremony mushrooms, I usually cut off part of the stem and then into quarters. So we have our mushrooms ready to go. And now we are just going to need two onions chopped into bite-sized pieces as well. So now that the soup broth has simmered for about 10 minutes, I'm going to add the onion and the mushrooms and let that cook for about five more minutes. Meanwhile, we are going to prepare our tomatoes. I just have two large tomatoes here. I've just quickly rinsed these and I'm going to remove the stem and slice them into wedges. We are also going to need some fish sauce. This is actually a vegan fish sauce. And if you don't already have any, I will put a link down below where you can find it on Amazon. And we are going to need about half a cup of this vegan fish sauce. And we're just going to add that to our soup, give it a stir and also a quick taste. 
Now optionally you could add some more fish sauce if you don't feel it's salty enough or a little bit of sugar if you think it needs a little bit of sweetness. But I thought mine tasted pretty perfect so I went ahead and added my tomatoes which is basically the end of the soup so I wanted to turn off my broth and just let those tomatoes soften in the hot broth. Now our next ingredient is going to be lime juice, which I have already frozen into ice cubes. So I'm just defrosting a few cubes, which is enough to make about half a cup of lime juice. And we want to add this at the very end, right before you're about to serve your tom yum. Now I like to serve this tom yum with a lot of vegetables. I am adding some broccoli and a few other kinds of Chinese vegetables. And then just ladle in your broth. Now if you see any of the kefir lime leaves or lemongrass stalks, you can just pick them out as we definitely don't want to eat them. And optionally you can garnish with a bit of coriander. Now Q on the other hand likes to eat his tom yum with noodles, which is also definitely an option. Just add your broth on top of some cooked noodles. Now with your leftover broth, I highly suggest to strain out the remaining vegetables and to store those in a separate Tupperware from the broth. Otherwise it can get a bit too soggy. So I usually just scoop everything out with a slotted spoon and add it to one Tupperware and then add the broth to however many Tupperwares are needed. Now again, if you see any of the galangal, lemongrass or kefir lime leaves, just go ahead and pick those out because we definitely don't wanna eat them. And go ahead and just store your Tupperwares in the fridge until you're ready to make your next soup. The next soup again falls into our super budget category because there are not many ingredients needed for this mushroom barley soup and the ones we do need are very inexpensive to buy. I already have out our barley which we are going to need to rinse first and then of course our potatoes and carrot. We also need our mushrooms, hold on. And so we also have our mushrooms, our veggie broth and our dill, which <laughs> I have frozen dill and I hope it's still good. It's been in there for a couple months, but should be fine, right? Oh yeah, still smells like dill. So I think we have everything we need to get started. The recipe says to saute the mushrooms separately, which I thought was a little bit unusual. Usually I would just put them into the soup with all the other ingredients, which I think would work well. But maybe sauteing them separately gives them a little extra flavor, caramelization, I don't know. So I am gonna do that. I will saute them separately just to follow the recipe and see if it makes a difference. But I think if you wanted to, you could totally just put them into the soup at the same time as your other veggies. Okay, so let's wash and chop our potatoes, carrots, garlic, and onion, and we will get started. Okay, soup is simmering and I'm just going to chop up these mushrooms and then start sauteing them. And I need to rinse these. Do you guys rinse your mushrooms before cooking them? I've always read that you're just supposed to use like a little brush or a damp cloth to remove any dirt, but I just find it so much easier to rinse them instead. And I haven't really noticed that much of a difference in like texture, but I'm just curious if that's normal, if you guys rinse them or not. But I'm gonna go ahead and rinse these, chop these, and then we will saute them. Them. 
Okay, so the recipe called for 500 grams of mushrooms and I just wanted to measure that out in cups and that is like more than four cups. So apparently the more mushrooms, the merrier, but I know that they do cook down a lot. So this will probably shrink to maybe half of this size by the time it's sauteed. But yeah, like five cups of mushrooms, holy moly. Let's go ahead and saute these and then we add them into the soup when the soup is basically finished simmering. Okay, while the soup is simmering and the mushrooms are sauteing, let's talk a little bit about barley because I didn't even realize that there are a bunch of different kinds of barley. Apparently there is like regular barley, pearl barley, pot barley, so many different kinds of barley. So let's just talk a little bit about what the different kinds are and also a little bit about the health benefits because apparently barley is really good for you. So apparently your most basic barley is going to be your most whole grain form of barley, which is also known as hull barley. So this would be where the outermost hull is removed, but the rest of it is considered an intact whole grain. It is also the healthiest form of barley. However, it does take the longest to cook. Pearl barley, on the other hand, is the most commonly found barley. It's actually the only one I've ever seen at the grocery store. And it is still nutritious, however, slightly less so than the hold barley, which of course is slightly less processed. So this will also cook a lot faster. This only takes about 40 minutes to cook. Now, once I read 40 minutes to cook, I was like, my soup says it should only cook in about 20 minutes. So I am a little bit concerned that the barley is not going to cook as quickly as the carrots and potatoes, but I just followed the recipe and the recipe said 20 minutes. So hopefully mine will cook just as fast. So some health benefits of barley include lower risk of heart disease, it may help in lowering cholesterol, and it may even protect against diabetes. So overall, barley is a really healthy grain. If you guys haven't tried it out before, it's quite nutty and chewy in flavor and texture, but you could always swap it out with buckwheat, brown rice, camu, any other kind of grain that you like if you don't like barley or you don't have it. Okay, so let's go ahead and add in our dill. My dill looks a little bit unusual because it was frozen and now it's just like damp, but I think it'll be fine. I think it's mainly for flavor in the soup, so that's fine. And then we'll also add in our mushrooms, let the soup mingle with all those flavors for a little bit longer, and then we will taste it, yay! This smells really good. I'm excited about it. And I checked the barley and it does feel done. It was very squishy between my fingers. So I think everything's good. I think this soup is ready to go. Granted, I did cook it a bit longer than 20 minutes in total. It was probably more like 30 to 35 minutes by the time everything was done cooking. If you wanted to speed that up, you could par cook your barley and that might help because you know, my carrots and potatoes are very, very soft. But let's go ahead and try this. Oh my gosh, it smells so good. Mmm. Mm. I think the only, only thing that I would change is like I said, maybe par cooking the barley next time just so the soup takes a little bit less time. And also there are a lot of mushrooms. I don't know if that whole five cups was really necessary, but I mean, it does add a really nice flavor. I'm not complaining about the mushrooms, maybe just a little bit less next time. Other than that, everything's good. Mm. Now, if you're looking for some tips on how to batch prep and store your soups so that you can make them in big batches and really save yourself time, I've actually made a free PDF guide. I'll link it down below. And of course, make sure you check it out. Again, it is absolutely free and I hope you guys enjoy.